Welcome to the 7th Annual Leonardo da Vinci Society for the Study of Thinking Colloquium and Luncheon. Now, I practiced that. I got through it, didn't I? My name is Jim Myers, and it's my pleasure to be your Master of Ceremonies today. To begin, I think we all should unlimber our hands a little bit and give a brief round of applause to the Allegro Quartet for serenading us while we all came in this morning. Thank you very much. And we'd also like to offer our special thanks to UAT President Jason Pistillo and the other members of the Pistillo family, Dominic and his lovely wife, Ann, who are seated right there at the head table. We, of course, thank the University of Advancing Technology for sponsoring and hosting this event. And, of course, our honored guest and keynote speaker for today, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, whom we will be hearing from a little bit later. And now I'd like to say just a few words about why we're here today. Leonardo da Vinci has often been described as the original Renaissance man whose unquenchable curiosity was equaled only by his powers of invention. He is widely considered to be one of the greatest thinkers and painters of all time, and perhaps the most diversely talented person to have ever lived. What could be more appropriate then than to name an organization devoted to thinking in honor of this great thinker? The Leonardo da Vinci Society for the Study of Thinking is a not-for-profit foundation a thinking think tank, if you will. The goal of the society is to help create a better tomorrow by fostering better thinking and the teaching of thinking skills worldwide today. We identify the world's greatest thinkers whose contributions to society deserve widespread public attention, and we engage them in the creation of new knowledge in the study of thinking. To build tomorrow's leaders, we encourage scholars and young people in the study and development of thinking skills. The society nurtures the belief that the world urgently needs new clarity and new ways of thinking now to meet the significant challenges of today and tomorrow. Better thinking worldwide is the only way we believe to accomplish that. One of the greatest thinkers of all time, Albert Einstein, said, and I, you, you may very well have heard this one before, Problems cannot be solved at the same level of awareness that created them. He also said, and you probably hear this about every other night on the news now, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Today and into the future, we hope you'll agree that our planet needs better problem solving, better design, better leadership, and in short, better thinking. We are all trained from birth in the dogmatic thinking patterns of our society. It is high time we invested in purposeful education in the subject and disciplines of thinking. And the Leonardo da Vinci Society for the Study of Thinking is one of the precious few organizations today trying to accomplish that. The society's important work includes focusing attention on today's best yet diverse thinking, introducing the thinking of the greatest thinkers in the world, working with these great thinkers to create new knowledge and build curriculum for the deliberate teaching of thinking in our schools, and finally, fostering the development of young thinkers by providing them with thinking scholarships. And we now would like to introduce you, and boy, I sure do hope he's here, to one of those Da Vinci Society scholarship recipients. He is 19 years old, he's majoring in network security, and he's going to tell us how his Da Vinci scholarship has affected his life. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome UAT sophomore, Joseph Costa. The podium's yours. All right, thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Joseph Costa, and I'm a recipient of the Dr. Edward DeBono Thinking Scholarship. I am a sophomore at UAT, entering my junior year in the fall. Speaking to all of you today, I would like to thank all of those involved in deciding to award me with this scholarship. As is the case with the majority of current college students in our society, paying for college is a burden. Loans are becoming fewer and farther between. And even when we are able to secure loans, 
often it's not enough. A college education is essential for making one's way into our society, and every little bit we can get helps. When I began to consider my options where colleges are concerned, I felt a pull to UAT. It's hard to find a college that offers more than what they deem a computer science degree, and most of these degrees focus on programming and a little bit of computer engineering. While this is no doubt important, it's hard to find even a little room for specialization. These schools offered little in the way of network security, which is what I'm truly interested in. UAT offered me a chance to further my knowledge in the field that I was passionate about. However, finances seemed like they would keep me from coming here. I applied for a lot of the scholarships at this school, and after a wait that seemed to take far too long, I heard back and was informed that not only had I received a scholarship, but it was the highest value scholarship offered at the college, for which I am truly grateful. If this weren't the case, I don't think I would have been able to attend UAT. In my experience, college students walk away with either a great love for their alma mater or a bad taste in their mouth. Either way, a student's choice in college impacts their future a great deal and has a very powerful influence over their development. This being considered, I thought long and hard about my experience so far at UAT. Obviously, no experience is perfect, and this is how it should be. A college should not only teach its students through the classroom, but by challenging them to deal with the obstacles in front of them. So far, I feel that UAT has done a great job of this. I've always been the kind of student that enjoys learning the things that interest me on my own, as much as I enjoy learning from professors. I feel that if UAT should be proud of one thing in particular, it should be the fact that the university does an excellent job of creating a sandbox environment for its students. While of course the school offers excellent classes in the standard format, the thing I appreciate the most is that the school's equipment is there for any student who wishes to utilize it. If I need to work with a series of virtual machines, I know I can go into the network security lab and work on whatever I need. If I had the notion to work with my hands, the robotics lab is open for use. UAT allows its students to follow whatever it is that interests them. Of my entire experience here at UAT, I feel this is what I'll appreciate the most after I'm gone. When I thought about uh, what it is that made me qualified as a scholarship recipient, I thought back to a time in high school when I was on the academic decathlon team. For those that aren't familiar with it, academic decathlon is a team where there are 10 events, usually in a row, that everyone is responsible for learning the material for. For those that have been on an academic team or any extracurricular activity, you understand the kind of work that goes into this. But to work on 10 events at once is a great deal of burden, or a great deal of work. My senior year, I was made team captain, and we had a new coach come in. However, about a quarter of the way through the year, she was diagnosed with cancer and had to leave the school. They weren't able to find a replacement coach, so the job fell to me. And I found that when I picked up where she had left off, she was unable to put anything towards the team. There was no curriculum, there was no timetable, there wasn't even the paperwork filled out for our next competition. Uh, I ended up having to take care of all of this, and it turned into what seemed like a 40 to 50 hour uh, a week job. But when I think back on it, even all the times it drove me crazy or made me want to quit, I found that I had no choice but to keep going, and it made me stronger for it. And as my dear friend Sky once told me, just keep smiling, it'll only make you stronger. When I thought about this while filling out the application for my scholarship, I felt that of all the things I've learned, the things that I put myself towards and things I learned for myself were what really made me a thinker. I am, as of yet, undecided concerning what I would like to do after college. There are a number of opportunities for those in the network security field, and the education received at UAT opens many paths for job seekers. So far, I have most strongly considered a job with the government, particularly the National Security Agency. While I realize that a position with the NSA entails a long interview and hiring process, it seems like a good fit. However, I'm still in an early phase of my education, so who knows what will happen. My feelings are most certainly apt to change, and I cannot deny the appeal of a job in the private sector. As with so many other students, my goals for the future are constantly being shifted as I learn more about myself and network with those around me. 
In conclusion, I would again like to thank everyone here for the opportunity to speak and extend my gratification to all those involved in granting me the Dr. Edward de Bono Thinking Scholarship and allowing me to achieve my dream. Please enjoy the rest of the luncheon. Thank you, Joe. Later on, by the way, I hope many of you will have an opportunity to meet with and talk with this extraordinary young man. Um, he's an interesting young guy. Now, it looks like lunch is served, so please enjoy the music and the conversation, and we'll return to today's program in about a half an hour. Thank you. We're about to begin the second half of the program, and I hope he's ready for this. The very first thing I'm going to do is to introduce you to the Honorable Hugh Hallman, the mayor of Tempe, Arizona, who will read today's proclamation. Mr. Mayor, let's have a hand for the mayor while he makes his way up here. I haven't been able to do that since I was 25. Fortunately, I don't look bad for 70. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor and a privilege to be with you today. Uh, this university is near and dear to my heart. Uh, Dominic and I were just talking about how long it is that perhaps we've known one another, and it seems at least 12 years, something along that order. But to be, have this university in the city of Tempe is perhaps the most important element of an educational society that I can think we can have. Why do I say that? We're home, after all, to this enormous university uh, to the east of us here. Uh, and here's just a little bit of an example of what this university does, not just as an institution that educates young people to become leaders in all sorts of ways in our society but as an institution in the sector that is frequently overlooked, private colleges. A private sector effort to teach students a different way. And it proves itself by the fact that students come here in droves and find ways to pay their tuition and work diligently, and the magic is that it also does something else extremely important for my society. It has created a level of competition in Tempe, Arizona, the original home of Arizona State University since 1885, that makes not only these students a great success, but helps make the president of that university work so much harder and more diligently to create success at that university. Competition is a fabulous thing. And Dominic, what you have done for our society, in addition to creating a great educational institution, is make everybody else step it up and perform to a level that is serving us all a whole lot better. So Dominic, thank you for your lifetime commitment to education and what it's done, not just for the students you educate, but for the students who don't make it here, and so thank you for that. In my capacity as mayor, I am here actually to provide a proclamation. It's my honor and privilege to read this. Unfortunately, my mother did teach me to read at age 12. Whereas advanced philosophers and intellectuals of our day posit that human beings have the power to create, structure, and positively influence our future. And whereas great thinkers throughout history have proven that we can discover new principles and invent new technologies to enhance the quality of life on Earth. And whereas a significant measure of the health of a person or a society can be demonstrated by the ability and desire to contribute to the positive advance of civilization by the power of innovation. And whereas the University of Advancing Technology is a nationally recognized I need to change that, is an internationally recognized and accredited educational institution that exemplifies the motto, learn, experience, innovate. And whereas the University of Advancing Technology has founded the Leonardo da Vinci Society for the Study of Thinking 
to support, enhance, and facilitate thoughtful, robust, and respectful dialogue, the end goal of which is to engage students, teachers, and community members in a forum to advance ingenious and innovative thinking. So now, therefore, I, Hugh Hallman, Mayor of the City of Tempe, Arizona, do hereby declare June 3, 2011, as Leonardo da Vinci Society Thinking Day in Tempe. Thank you for this opportunity. And finally, you, you thought you got to cut in. Dominic has to admit, I think, when he thinks back, that I may be also the most bizarre commencement speaker the university's ever had. Because in downtown Phoenix, I'm sad to say it was in downtown Phoenix, I did something that most 70-year-olds can't do, and certainly is impossible with a boot on your foot. But I'm so inspired, Dominic, I can't help it. Thank you again for the invitation. Let's see if I can do this. One should be excited about this university. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and congratulations on your continuing spryness. We appreciate that. As that proclamation says, the Da Vinci Society seeks to elevate the general public's esteem and understanding of thinking and great thinkers. It does this by honoring great thinkers in our midst and supporting the pursuit of new discoveries in thinking. In the last several years, the Da Vinci Society has inducted several distinguished members, and of course you've been watching their pictures rotate on the screens here, including thinking pioneer Dr. Edward de Bono, systems thinker Dr. Margaret Wheatley, physicist, metaphysicist Dr. Fritjof Kepra, scientist Dr. Michio Kaku, inventor and futurist Dr. Ray Kurzweil, and theoretical biologist Dr. Lynn Margulis. To encourage young thinkers, the Society awards scholarships in honor of these awardees each year, and you just met one of our scholarship winners. Now, ladies and gentlemen, to tell you more about all of this, I would like to introduce New York Times best-selling author, Charles Goyette. Many of you who share my age bracket, which is not a small one, I assure you, will remember that Charles spent many years as an award-winning radio personality right here in Phoenix. He also happens to be an inaugural member of the Board of Directors of the Leonardo da Vinci Society for the Study of Thinking. So please welcome Charles Goyette. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is a, uh, a great pleasure for me, one of the joys of my life, to be in the company of interesting people like yourselves and people who are interested in interesting people as well. So welcome, it's so good that you could come here and support this, uh, this organization. Since uh, Dominic founded uh, this organization, we have a, a number of accomplishments, I think you can see from uh, the, the roster of prior inductees that uh, we have had an, an impact, we have contributed to the life of the mind here in this community, but on a, a broader stage away, uh, as well, in ways that are still not perhaps entirely apparent, but we have bigger plans going forward. And so, although this isn't in my notes or the script for today, I'd like to invite all of you to take a moment and find a, a brochure on your tabletop. And if you can help us in this, uh, in this event, Look, it's, it's a wonderful thing to live in America where we are champions of entertainment. And, and you know, I, I like Scotty and Haley and those people on American Idol and Dancing with the Stars. And so we have all of that, but, but one of our objectives at the Da Vinci Society is to raise the public's esteem for people who have made contributions to the life of the mind, at least to the level of American Idol performers. And so... <laughs> We've got our work cut out for us, uh, obviously, but if you can help us, there is a, a, a way that you can make a contribution. It's a 501c3 uh, organization. You'll find a, a, a brochure on your tabletop. We very much need your, your help for some of the things that we have planned going forward. With that said, let me introduce to you our inductee today, our honored guest on February 6th, 1971. Captain Edgar Mitchell, Doctor of Science, became the sixth man to walk on the moon and spent nine hours working on the lunar surface. A scientist, a test pilot, a naval officer, astronaut, entrepreneur, author, 
lecturer. Dr. Mitchell's extraordinary uh, career personifies humankind's eternal thrust to widen its horizons as well as our desire to explore the inner soul. His academic background includes a Bachelor of Science in Industrial Management from Carnegie Mellon University, a Bachelor of Science degree from the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School, a Doctor of Science in Aeronautics and Astronautics from uh, MIT. Dr. Mitchell has received many awards and honors, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the United States Navy Distinguished Medal, three NASA Group Achievement Awards. He was inducted into the Space Hall of Fame in 1979 and the Astronaut Hall of Fame in 1998. After retiring from the Navy, Dr. Mitchell founded the Institute of Noetic Sciences. He has devoted the last 38 years to studying human consciousness and psychic and paranormal uh, phenomena in a search for a common ground between the world of science and the world of spirit. Nominee as well for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2005. Dr. Mitchell, if you join us here on the stage for the presentation. Carl, so nice to be with you. Just as, a, uh, just as a note of color, we heard something uh, at dinner the other night with Dr. Mitchell that we will never hear again, but it made several of us kind of smile. He said uh, very casually about, he said, well, you know, when I got back from the moon, then I went and did this and that and the other. And we thought, well, when I got back from Safeway, I went and checked my email. You know, it just <laughs> sort of had that, that feel to it. Let me read the citation from the Leonardo da Vinci Society uh, to you. It reads, be it known... The Board of Directors of the Leonardo da Vinci Society for the Study of Thinking declares that Edgar Mitchell, Dr. Mitchell, through his revolutionary life's work in human consciousness, science, and spirit, has enhanced the intellectual progress of mankind. And therefore, he is hereby inducted into the Leonardo da Vinci Society for the Study of Thinking. We further declare, as a society and as an institution, that he has elevated and made accessible to all a greater understanding of our complex world. Therefore, the University of Advancing Technology grants him every right, honor, and privilege pertaining to the title of Professor of Thinking. Given here in Tempe, in the state of Arizona, this third day of June, 2011, the Da Vinci Medallion, Dr. Mitchell. Thank you, sir. May I present, ladies and gentlemen, the 2011 inductee in the Leonardo da Vinci Society for the Study of Thinking and our honored guest for today, Dr. Edgar Mitchell. Thank you, Carl. You're very kind. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you all. This is a wonderful event. I feel very, very honored by the presence of all of you, by the distinguished mayor here, the distinguished thinkers, and I feel very privileged to be invited to join this society. To say a few words to you, I'd like to, to tell a few sto couple of stories. <clears throat> I sp do a lot of speaking to young people, and since we're at a university that specializes in helping young people reach the height of the best they can be, I like to start out telling, <clears throat> getting young people that I speak to, to get a, a perspective of the timber of our time. And I do it in the start in the following way. I point out that my great grandparents went across from South Georgia to West Texas after our Civil War to start a new life. They traveled in covered wagons pulled by horses had a few had a cattle with them. Railroads weren't complete across the South and the West. Automobiles weren't invented. Electric lights weren't invented. My father was born shortly after the Wright brothers made their first flight. And I went to the moon. So from covered wagons to going to the moon, in just under a hundred years is the timber of our time. And 
to put that in perspective. It didn't mean a lot to me until here I am just past 80 years old, which is a goodly portion of a century, and yet what I was talking about, the progress of the world and our nation in particular as a leader of all of that, from covered wagons to going to the moon in just under 100 years. To me, I, I can hardly grasp it, even though I say it. And I think maybe you have a little problem grasping the enormity of this last century. And since this is a university, and most of us are, the folks here are well, very well educated, a part of what we're dealing with is the fact that although we all learned in high school and in our early studies about the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in Europe, the Industrial Revolution didn't really get going till the end of the 19th century, when the great thinkers at that period, Madame Curie, the other great inventors, <coughs> Albert Einstein, started to change the world that we live in. And the best way to express that is that every measure of human activity took on an exponential growth curve. Every measure of human activity moved into exponential growth very rapidly, showing up at the beginning at the end of the 20th, of the 19th century and into the 20th century. Primarily driven by population, by survivability, longevity, every measure started to move up. And one of the things that those of us here interested in science uh, <coughs> came to realize <coughs> is that for the 400 years prior to the beginning of our 20th century, science had grown up as strictly a materialist concept that following Descartes in the 1600s, who said that body, mind, physicality, spirituality belong to different realms of reality that don't interact, have so served a very noble purpose of getting the inquisition of that period off the backs of the intellectuals so they quit burning them at the stake for disagreeing with the church as long as they stayed away from mind and consciousness and such things that were considered religious or theological issues. Until the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century when the great thinkers of that point started to realize something different was happening. And it began with the idea, is light a particle or a wave? And it had been argued back and forth by the great thinkers for quite a few centuries. Is light a particle or a wave? And Einstein put it, that idea kind of to bed by saying, hey, it's really both, depending on how you look at it, the way you measure it. It can be both, and it is both. And dear friends, that was the beginning of quantum mechanics that didn't get really formulated until the, the middle of the, of the 1920s. And we have lived through most of the 20th century, however, in academia with the idea in physics that still stayed right with the Cartesian duality, that body-mind were different realms of reality that did not interact, when indeed the very canon and the very properties that were arising in quantum mechanics showed that not to be true. The Cartesian duality simply is not true, and we've known it for almost 100 years, but it's only the latter part of the 20th century and into the 21st century <clears throat> that we have now started to really put that into practice. And why do I consider that important? Why am I making an issue about it? 
because the study of consciousness shows that most of what we're talking about as being conscious and mindful has to do with quantum information. To illustrate that property a little bit, I'll just say a couple of things. I quite often say to me in my talks that we consider <clears throat> intuition our sixth sense in the English language. We call it our sixth sense. It's really our first sense. Should be considered that because it's rooted in the quantum world and was around long before this solar system that we're in came about and we came about. It's merely more, it's the most fundamental information structure that we know about. And that, of course, is what I have studied in my noetic group for the last 40 years since coming back from the moon because I realized as I looked at this earth from deep space and saw it like this, a powerful experience. And since I think everybody here has one of my books, my latest book, the story that's in there about coming back from the moon and seeing Earth from a new perspective, that was a life-changing perspective, it's in there for you to read about. But the whole notion that came out of that is we are one. We're, we came from the same place. We're all of the same stuff. And here we are in a century where every measure of human activity is on an exponential growth curve, and it doesn't take great genius to understand that that cannot continue indefinitely in a finite space. And we have a planet that is a finite space in this immense universe that we're in, and if we want to make it sustainable, we're going to have to rethink and change the way we live because right now we cannot continue to do what we have been doing. And for one illustration, I'll get on my soapbox here. If we think about energy and what it takes to keep this civilization going, we have been told and we note that uh, tearing off the tops of mountains to get to the coal underneath must now come to an end because we're destroying too many mountains and polluting too many rivers and clogging up too many lakes with the debris that comes from that. We're now past peak oil, which uh, I, wrote a <clears throat> I wrote a paper quite a few years ago on how long can free market capitalism endure in the absence of an ideological opponent, and that was at the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the demise of the communist state in the Soviet Union. And then the answer to that it was about 35 years because through our own excesses and greed, we have virtually collapsed the economic system of the world three years ago because we didn't realize that we needed to do things for the greater good instead of for the serving our own individual interests. But to finish my little story here that I was telling, we passed peak oil. If we have learned any lesson from Chernobyl and the recent Japanese experience, that nuclear energy is not really the safest way to power our civilization. So we've got to look deeper. And that's one of the things I have been doing since I came back from space and looking at these issues is how do we get down to that very basic energy from which all matter is created called the zero point energy field. And I think that is the future that we have to find out about and which I spend my days working on with my team members and looking for ways to do it better. That is part of the new science that, has, that needs to be developed. And another part of it coming out of my work in noetics is the discovery that Max Planck, who a great, one of the greats, of course, of the end of the 19th century, who discovered black body radiation, that one of my colleagues in Europe named Walter Schimp, who is a descendant of Kepler, has discovered that, that Planck's black body radiation is indeed coherent and carries information about 
the physical objects and all physical objects emit this sort of radiation. And it's coherent and quantum entangled, and we call it the quantum hologram. That and the zero point energy field, which is the basis of all the matter and the information. By the way, the quantum hologram, if those of you who have studied the ancient uh, philosophies a little bit, realize that our ancient ancestors thought that <clears throat> nature did not lose its experience, that all experience was maintained and uh, recorded in some way. They called it the Akashic Record. As I started digging in, I called it the giant, <clears throat> the uh, hard disk in the sky. And then Walter Shemp came along and found that Pl Planck's black body radiation was coherent and quantum entangled. And suddenly we have a mechanism in science to explain what the ancients call the Akashic Record and explain several other things that we understand about information in our civilization. So it's those types of developments that will offer us some new ways of looking at ourselves and new ways to solve the great problems that are besetting us. And I have never been uh, bashful about saying these days that I'm quite sure that we have been visited by uh, distant citizens from distant, distant planets <coughs> and uh, that they are among us and have been watching us. And <coughs> it may be a lot more for a lot many more years than we've given credit for. But nevertheless, the reason I bring that up <coughs> is for them to be here, as I believe that they are. They have had to use the very types of energy that we're talking about needing to harness in order for us to survive because we have to become a universal civilization ourselves if we're going to survive because this planet isn't going to be here forever nor neither is our sun and so if we're going to continue and that's a few years off we got a few years <laughs> but if we're going to survive as a civilization we have to think beyond where we are at this moment and all of what I'm talking about is the science that is required to move in this direction to provide us the very things we need to survive. But I have great confidence that we can do that. That the one lesson that I learned as I looked at this planet from space is that we're all one, that love and harmony and caring for each other and serving the greater good is really where we should be heading <coughs> with our future, that it begins with each one of us to learn to serve the greater good. There is a saying in many of our spiritual teachings, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. And ladies and gentlemen, that's what it has to be. It has to begin with each one of us. We have to learn how to live together and certainly quit killing each other over whose God is the best God. And because we have some disagreements over borders and that sort of thing, we need to find out how to resolve those issues short of violence. And although I spent 20 years in the military, thanks to the Korean War and the draft that brought, took me there, I became a firm peacenik in my thinking and particularly after being in space and looking at this little Earth like that from a distance. And we will go to Mars in not too distant future, I'm sure. And I say this in my lectures too. When we go to Mars and look back at this tiny little planet, and it'll look very, very small from Mars. We don't have the technology to do it right now. But when we do, and look at this little planet from that distance, It'll be kind of foolish to say, I came from the United States, Canada, England, Israel, Germany, or wherever. No, we came from Earth. And we're not ready to do this as a civilization yet. We need to get our act together and learn to survive as a civilization. And ladies and gentlemen, that is my message. I feel very honored to be a part of this August group. I feel very honored to have been inducted into this organization. 
and I wish you well. I thank you very much for being here today. Goodbye. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell, and congratulations again on both this award and on your history of extraordinary achievements. And now, I'm sure that you're all just dying to get back to the office on this 95-degree Friday, so I'm going to wrap this up quickly. We believe the world urgently needs clarity and new ways of thinking now to meet significant challenges of today and tomorrow. Better thinking worldwide is the only way to accomplish that. We need the help of anyone who believes in a better future. If you would like to invest in that future through a tax-deductible donation to the Da Vinci Society to support thinking and thinkers, please do so via the brochure at your table or by visiting the website at www.davincithinking.org. Finally, I'd like to offer our thanks to M Catering by Chef Michael, Thank you for the fine food today, and to everyone in the audience for attending today's event. We very, very much appreciate your support. Please have a safe journey home, and please have a great weekend. Thank you.